Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again. We're back at it with RDO Jones checking out how we can bring life to static scenes. In my Asset Heroes video, we looked at a switch mechanic to unlock a portion of a scene, and I wanted to show you how you might go about that, so let's get to it. We are in the Lost Valley of the Ancients. This scene is available in the Dreamiverse and fully remixable, so take a look in there and follow along if you like. For this video, I've added a new sequence, and we'll talk about how to make something like it. We'll start off with a cutscene to introduce the scenario. There's no way to get across this putrid, deadly pond. Let's see if we can find a way. Since RDO Jones is a fairly sarcastic take on games, we'll use a switch mechanic trope as a joke and show you exactly where you need to go. Hop onto the Media Molecule Made Ancient Temple switch pad and we activate a brief cutscene where our hidden bridge swings into action, allowing us to hop across and continue our quest. So right off the bat, we have a number of objectives. The first is to create a cutscene introducing the scenario and giving the player a hint of what they should do or where they should go. I have all that in a microchip. The first thing we need is a trigger zone to detect the player. That will determine if and when our sequence plays. That trigger zone will then activate a timeline that will initiate the cutscene. We will remove player control, run through the sequence, and then return player control when the sequence is done. In this case, the sequence consists of three camera positions, an audio sample, and a couple of text displayers displaying the text of the audio sample. There are a couple of reasons you might do that. Our monologue is done in a squeaky cartoon voice and it isn't the most easily understood. Another good reason is accessibility. If you have both text and audio, you've covered people with hearing and vision problems. When the cutscene is done, our player will make their way to the painfully obvious objective. They will hop onto the switch pad and activate the sequence, which is in this microchip. Inside, I have a couple of trigger zones set up to kill the player with a wireless signal, if they get any ideas about wandering too far off course. The output of the switch pad is hooked up to a timeline in this microchip, and that timeline will run the bridge sequence. The timeline consists of a couple of keyframes, a couple of audio samples, a switch to activate a visual effect, a camera for the sequence, and a destroyer to destroy the sequence after it's played. The keyframes consist of the original position of the object and the final position. Keep changes is enabled on the second keyframe so that the bridge stays in place. The switch is hooked up to the power of the visual effect. So that effect has power whenever the playhead of the timeline is overlapping the switch. As a general rule in video games, anytime there is action, you want to reinforce that action with a sound effect and a visual effect. Our camera creates a very brief cutscene sequence where we see the bridge moving into place from pretty close to RDO's perspective. Then at the end, the destroyer gets rid of the visual effect and the timeline. If you want to play the sequence more than once, you do not use a destroyer this way, and you'll wire things up slightly differently. And that is the entire sequence. As you can see, it's pretty simple, but some of that has to do with Media Molecule doing a lot of grunt work for us inside that switch, so let's dig deeper and see if we can figure out what they did. As a contraption, this is set up with an input node, internal logic, and an output node. In its simplest use, you just hook up the output to whatever you want to activate like we did here. The input node is kind of clever in that it allows you to use this pad in two different ways. One is the way we're using it, but you can also set it up so that another action has to unlock the button so that you can then hop onto it. But let's open up all the internal logic so we can decipher it. This consists of three main microchips and we'll go through them one at a time. The first one handles the input coming from the input node that is visible on the pad. I don't have anything hooked up to the input, but you'll notice it has two outputs. The top one outputs the input signal. The other one sends a signal when the input is hooked up. So in this case, there will be no signal on the top wire because there is no signal coming into the node. Because of this, there will also not be a signal on the bottom wire because there's nothing hooked up to the input of the node. That's a subtle difference, but important, and we'll see why in a second. 
The top wire, which is the input signal, runs into a through node, and you can see there are a series of these. What's happening there is that the nodes are carrying the signals through to all three microchips independent of anything else. Basically, we're saying, okay, we have an input wired up, let's make sure everything in this logic has access to it. And as an example, you can see there's a wire from the through node going into a trigger zone on the button. So if the input is wired and has signal, that trigger zone will be active and the signal also goes to the next through node. So what's up with that NOT gate in the lower left hand corner? Remember, we have two signals coming in. The second signal is if the input is hooked up at all. So if we just drop the pad into a scene and hook nothing up to the input, we do not get a signal from that wire. A NOT gate is a logic gate, which means it determines true-false states. A NOT gate will only activate if the signal going into it is false. Is the input wired? False. But based on that, the NOT gate will send a signal and that will flow through the rest of the logic. But why, Lucid, why? To let you use the pad even if you haven't hooked anything up to the input, that's why. In the next microchip we have some branching logic. From here things are strongly intermediate, so if you're a logic beginner I'll try to make this less confusing, but logic is like anything else. It will seem like a mystery without practice. We have two signals coming in again. One is still the signal carried through the first microchip, but we altered it slightly in there. Now the signal tells us the state of the input signal or if the input is not hooked up. From there the signal goes to four different places. One place is the node up top, the next is a NOT gate near the bottom, third is another NOT gate on the right hand side, and lastly the signal goes through and out to the next microchip. Let's take a look at these one at a time. For the node up top our input signal is running into power so the logic statement is if this overall contraption does not have anything hooked up to input or the input signal is inactive, this node will have power. The node is a through node, which means it has an input signal and an output signal. The input signal comes from the trigger zone, so if a player controlled object is on the button, you'll get a signal into the node. The output signal runs through to the next microchip, so the overall logic statement is, if this contraption is in a ready to use state and something is on the button, do whatever is in the next microchip. On to the NOT gate near the bottom. Remember, we're doing the opposite of the logical statement with this. So if the overall contraption is not ready to use, then we get a signal. That signal then goes into a node which does nothing. So why do this at all? Let's have a short discussion about programming. A lot of the time in programming you run into situations where there are a lot of possible outcomes but you really only care about a few. However, you do not want your program to ever do something unexpected. To avoid that, you can be explicit about what occurs for every outcome. Sometimes that translates to do this, do this, do this, and for every other condition, do nothing. In this case, we only have one extra condition. One thing this also does is allows the end user to hook something up to occur when this contraption is not ready to be used. So if it's not, maybe you want a sound or a visual effect to play. You would hook that up to this node. The other NOT gate in question has two input signals attached, one of which goes to power. Remember the signal coming from the upper through node is the trigger zone signal, so what we're determining here is if the character is NOT in the trigger zone. Power is active when the overall contraption is ready to be used. If both of these conditions are met, signal flows into a signal manipulator which will pulse signal at ON. So the overall logic statement is when the character has just left the trigger zone and this contraption is ready to be used, do this. You might look at this next microchip and think, holy crap, this thing is three times bigger than the last one. This is going to be crazy. However, at this point, we've done most of the conditional heavy lifting and what's left is consequence. But let's run through this top to bottom. Top, when something is in the trigger zone and therefore the button is pressed, play a sound and activate a keyframe. The keyframe causes the button to move downward. See, this is simpler. You also have a signal running to a through node and ultimately to the output node so you can use the button press signal to do something, which is exactly what we'll do once we escape from the logical hell that is this contraption. 
Next down the list we're running our button reset signal through a node and using it to activate a sound in a keyframe. The keyframe restores the button to its original uh, position. Again, simple stuff. Yay! The rest of the logic in here pertains to another state this switch pad is capable of wherein you can lock the pad down and make it so that the pad has to be unlocked by something else before you can use it. Again, these are mainly consequences, so view this as when the button is unlocked, play this effect, this sound, and activate these keyframes. Since we're not using that part of the contraption, I'll leave it at that. Now that we know everything that's happening, take a look at the sequence again and see if you can spot all the logic we just talked about. So in this video we talked about how to add a simple switch to your scene to unlock a new area. Many more videos are in the pipeline and I hope to continue to expand into new content. But that's all for now. Until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.